All right. So we are continuing our Sunday night series on Bible prophecy. And we're actually tackling probably one of the most difficult sections here in, in dealing with the majority of, our, of the preaching tonight is be coming from the book of Daniel. And Daniel is, is probably, at least in my opinion, it's, it's the most difficult prophetic um, chapters that there are regarding, regarding end times prophecy. There's a lot, I mean, there's a lot packed in here. There's a lot of information in the books of Daniel. But um, I've mentioned this in the past, I'll mention it again, that when, especially when we're looking at the Old Testament scriptures, that we need to remember that there, there oftentimes can be multiple applications of, of nearer term events as well as end times events. Uh, as you read through, you're going to read um, some of the, the prophecies were given about the, the Medo-Persian Empire and the Grecian Empire. And that's explained and that's spelled out, right? And where we get our doctrine from is from the clear statements in the Bible. And um, we use anything that, that might be symbolic references as uh, supporting evidence, unless it's explicitly given, this is exactly what this means. And that's why we derive our understanding of end times events mostly from the book of Revelation. That's why I started off the series going through an overview of the book of Revelation because that is what God has revealed. You notice here, if you're reading, we just read this whole chapter, and as you read the other chapters too, Daniel didn't understand. He saw these visions. He saw things that are going to be happening in the last days, and he didn't understand what they were, what they meant, what is going on. He's always asking, I mean, He's having angels come in and telling him this is what this means and this is what it means, and he still doesn't understand what it means. He still isn't quite getting it. And God basically says, it's okay. You know, it's not for you to understand all this stuff anyways. I'm telling you this now, but don't worry. Seal it up. It's not for, you know, a long time later, right? It's, it's, it's not for time to come. And it wasn't until then after Jesus Christ came and there was more things revealed through the Apostle Paul and then, of course, through the, uh, John with the revelation when Jesus Christ gave John this, this revelation of things that are going to happen in the end times. So we are starting with, even though we're going to be spending the most of our time here in the book of Daniel, with the understanding of our doctrines coming still from the book of Revelation primarily. Revelation, Matthew, 2 Thessalonians, these, these areas where the New Testament is shining more light into the, into the, the dark sayings in the Old Testament and the things that were not as easily comprehended prior to having the information given to us in the New Testament. So um, we're going to keep that in mind. And that's the, the topic for tonight's sermon is actually the abomination of desolation. This is something that, that if you've been reading your Bible, you should be familiar with hearing that before. It's, it's mentioned multiple times in the Bible. It's actually a very significant event when we're talking about the timeline, when things happen. It's an event that you can use to to know when things happen before and after that, um, especially when we're talking about rapture and, and, and those types of things. The abomination of desolation is an event that happens in a short period of time right around all of those, you know, with, between the Antichrist, abomination of desolation, persecution, great tribulation, rapture, all of these things are happening pretty close together. So it's one of these moments that, that you can use when you're building your own timeline of, when, uh, last week we did the day of the Lord. Right? When does the day of the Lord happen? Well, it happens after this and before this, and you can, you can make sense of when events are happening in Bible prophecy. Well, the abomination of desolation is another one of those events. And we actually have in the book of Daniel days and times and, and, and pretty good information about when these things happen. A certain event happens, and then this many days later, and it goes, you know, it, we're going to get into all that tonight. So, um, first of all, I just want to discuss the meaning, the term, the abomination of desolation. I mean, you hear it as something sometimes that's just tossed out there a lot, but what does that even mean? Um, I'm just going to read for you from Jeremiah and Ezekiel. Uh, these terms are used not referring to the actual abomination of desolation that we're talking about Bible prophecy, but the terms are used... Um, in other, in other ways, but with the same, a similar meaning. Jeremiah 44, 22 says, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you have committed. Therefore is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse 
without an inhabitant as it is this day. Abomination is something that God hates, right? And a desolation is desolate. It's, it's, it's empty. It's, it's, you know, usually when there's destruction or something comes upon a city or, or people, it's, it's made desolate. It's, it's made just completely empty and, and void. So the abomination of desolation, the, you might be going, well, what is that? We're going to see that in a minute here in Daniel chapter 12. I'm just going to read for you one more reference using those two words in the same sentence. Uh, Ezekiel 33, 29 says, Then shall they know that I am the Lord when I have laid the land most desolate because of their abominations which they have committed. So it's a desolation that occurs as a result of abominations being committed in the land. And that's, that's the most simple answer to what it is. Abomination of desolation. And typically, what causes or prompts the Lord to make a land desolate is their disobedience to his laws and just an utter rejection of God. And they go and start building their idols and going to false gods and completely, totally rejecting the Lord 100%. That is usually the point that God, that people need to get to before God decides to come in and lay a land desolate. God is very long-suffering and merciful and will put up with a lot of stuff and a lot of sins and a lot of iniquities and, and various things that happen. But when the people just finally just completely forget God, forget the Lord, forget Jehovah, and just worship Baal and, and you know, worship the devil, then God says, fine, that's, an, that's, that's it, I've had enough. And that's usually what needs to happen for, for this type of event to happen, for the desolation. Let's go back here to Daniel chapter 12. We're going to get a little bit of time, timing here with this event. Daniel 12 is very short, so let's look at verse number 1. The Bible says, And at that time shall Michael stand up. And this is, of course, continuing on from chapter 11. We're going to get into chapter 11. We're going to get into chapter 10. We're going to get into chapter 8. We're going to get into chapter 9. We're going to get into various chapters. And bear with me because there's a couple points I want to make. We're going to cover the abomination of desolation first and kind of the timing of it. And then we're going to go a little bit backwards tonight. So we're not going to go through like a, a chronology from front to back. We're actually kind of going to start with this point of abomination, desolation, and kind of work around it. So uh, just keep that in mind. We're not going chronologically straight through this thing. Um, but there's a good reason for that. So let's look at here, verse number one. And at that time shall Michael stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people, and there shall be a time of trouble, such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. And at that time thy people shall be delivered, every one that shall be found written in the book. And many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Now, I think that understanding Bible prophecy is something that everyone should do on their own. I mean, any topic, really. Doing a good Bible study on, on doctrines and on what you believe is a great idea. Now, I've put together, you know, you come to church, you hear sermons, the things that I've put work into, and, I, and I've uh, put scriptures side by side and present them to you. But you will learn a lot on your own and you'll be able to retain the most information because this is going to be, I mean, some people might consider this to be kind of a dry sermon because I'm going to be covering just a lot of facts and just and, and really drawing a lot of parallels with scripture. But for you to, to really be able to then take this information and be able to explain it to someone else, you need to dig into it and kind of do some of the legwork yourself. And you'll learn a lot more probably even than what you'll learn tonight if you don't already know what I'm covering tonight, uh, when you take the time and you recognize a lot of these phrases and be able to, to compare Scripture with Scripture to, to, un, to get a, a complete understanding of, of the events that's going to happen in the future. So if you haven't noticed already here in, in verse number one, the, the wording itself is very, very similar with what we're going to see in Matthew chapter 24. And if you want to, you could go ahead and put a finger in Matthew 24 because we're going to be there. But we're going to be spending, like I said, the majority of our time is going to be in Daniel. We are going to go to Matthew 24 and kind of look at a lot of the similarities and, and just demonstrate these are talking about the same event. It's talking about the same thing. So when it says here there's a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation and even at that same time and that at that time thy people shall be delivered. This is talking about the great tribulation and it's talking about the rapture, your people being delivered. And it's for those, this is everyone that should be found written in the book. The people who are saved, those are believers. Your name's in the book of life, right? It makes perfect sense. 
That's what he's talking about here in verse number one. Verse number two, oh, we read that already. Jump down now to verse number six. It says, And one said to the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, How long shall it be to the end of these wonders? And I heard the man clothed in linen, which was upon the waters of the river, when he held up his right hand and his left hand unto heaven, and swear by him that liveth forever and ever, it shall be for a time, times, and in half. And when he shall have accomplished to scatter the power of the holy people, all these things shall be finished. Now, I want you to pay note of just this, this term, the holy people. In this context, it's definitely talking about believers. It's talking about those who are saved, just like it did in, in verse number one. And the time frame, we see this over and over and over and over again. A time, times and a half, is literally it's three and a half because a time is singular. So you say, well, well a what is a time? I mean, is it a year, a month, a day? It becomes evident when you start comparing it with other Bible prophecy. A time is one, times is plural, which we could infer is going to be two. I mean, it's two or more, but if you have a time, a times, and a half, you're going to have one plus two plus a half, which is three and a half. I mean, it's the most simple explanation for what this is talking about. Three and a half, if you're familiar, three and a half years is the middle of the week. Daniel's 70th week is, um, it's a seven day week, right? So right in the middle is three and a half, three and a half years. And if you have your chart, you remember that's the one um, right roughly around the, the midpoint is going to be the rapture and the abomination. Desolation. These things all happen in a short time frame, a matter of like a couple months within that, that, that frame in the middle of the whole seven year period that some people call the tribulation, which is not the tribulation, is tribulation in the first half, wrath in the second half. So, um, this seven-year this seven period. This is talking about um, when, when the man asked the question, hey, how long shall it be to the end of these wonders? Well, it's going to be three and a half years, is what he's saying. It's going to take three and a half years for, it to be, for all these things to be finished. Jump down to verse number 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be a thousand 290 days. So here we get a good time frame here and a good definition just as I was, I began with the abomination of desolation of what it really means. There is an abomination that makes desolate that's going to be set up and that abomination is going to cause the desolation. It's really going to cause the um, God's wrath and, and all of that to be poured out. So there's abomination that's going to make desolate and is going to, you know, I think there's a two-fold meaning there with the, the, the desolation is wiping out believers as well as then the desolation is going to come with God's wrath. So um, it tells us there that it's going to be 2,290 days. That's from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination set up. And just to do the math for you, 1,290 days is three years and seven months. So three years and six months would be three and a half. So this is three years and seven. It's just a little bit longer than the three and a half year time frame. Um, that is start, the starting point of that is when the daily sacrifice is taken away. So there is going to be a rebuilding of the temple in Jerusalem. Solomon's temple, at the, you had the first building with um, King Solomon, of course. He's the one that established that. King David wanted to build it. Solomon built it. We already covered that in our first King series. And then the children of Israel were taken captive by Babylon. They come out of captivity. You know, the, the, the temple had been destroyed. And they were under orders then to rebuild the temple. And this is actually right around the time of Daniel's time. And he actually does some prophecy. And, he's, and he's, he starts off, and I forget what chapter it is, He's studying from Jeremiah's prophecies when they're going to be able to go back into the land, the 70 years that were determined that they can go back to the land because Daniel's just trying to figure this out, saying, hey, when can we go back? And he's praying unto God and confessing the sins of him and his people and, and everything else and looking forward to going back and rebuilding that temple. So that temple was rebuilt. You read Ezra, Nehemiah. We read about the accounts of the rebuilding of that second temple, Solomon's temple. 
and then of course that was destroyed again after just after the time of Jesus Christ and now the Bible is still prophesying a third temple that will be built because there will be um, daily sacrifices that are going to be going on at that time which is interesting we were talking about this before service we know that anyone who's going to be offering up sacrifices is not saved i mean they're not going to be like people who are believers saying hey let's let's offer up a lamb sacrifice because believers are going to be knowing that he's the the lamb sacrificed once from the foundation of the world it, we're not looking to create any sacrifices in some temple this is going to be some type of unbelievers probably jews i mean it's probably going to be the jews that are going to rebuild their temple and, and reinstitute the 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 sacrifices and um but when the Antichrist comes on the scene, because that's who we're talking about here in Daniel chapter 12, he's going to take away the daily sacrifice, I believe, because he's going to be claiming to be the second coming. And we're going to get into all this. We're going to see all the scripture evidence to support this. I'll just give you a quick overview. He's going to cause that to stop, the daily sacrifice, and he's going to be standing in the temple proclaiming to be God. So yeah, you don't need to sacrifice anymore because I'm here. And he'll probably play into, the, the reason why they're even going to start doing the sacrifices again, we don't know what it is now, but what will my hunch is that what's going to happen is he's going to end up fulfilling, right, something, the reason that they're even doing it to begin with. And they'll say, oh, see, since we started doing this now, this is what we've been missing the whole time. We just start doing this, you know, the, the, the sacrifices, and here comes our Messiah. This is what God has been waiting for. We've been so dumb all these years. This is what he's been waiting to do is just for these sacrifices to come back and now our Messiah can, can come back for us. And that was, um, that's the way I believe it's going to be played out and why it even begins to, to, in the first place, why they reinstitute the daily sacrifices. So um, in any case, we see that the abomination that make it desolate is set up after the daily sacrifice is taken away. And it says there's going to be 1,290 days of, of the abomination of desolation being set up for, and it's going to remain. And uh, verse number 12 says, Blessed is he that waiteth and cometh to the 1,305 and 30 days. So 1,335 days is basically, it's another 45 days after that 1,290. This is the time frame that I believe is going to be the... Um, the Great Tribulation. The Great Tribulation is prompted when the abomination of desolation is set up. And I believe that the, from the time that it's set up, if you can come, if you can make it that extra 45 days, then you will be, um, you'll be good. So you'll, you'll be here for the return of Jesus Christ. Verse number 13 says, But go thy way, Till the end be for thou shalt rest and stand in thy lot at the end of the days now keep your finger in daniel 12 and turn if you to matthew 24. matthew 24 we see another reference the abomination of desolation daniel 12 we saw the abomination that maketh desolate being set up and then the time frame given there matthew 24 we're going to see another reference here and we're going to see from Matthew 24 that this marks that beginning of the great tribulation I was just uh, talking about. Matthew 24, verse 15 says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. That's what we're reading in the book of Daniel. The abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet. Stand in the holy place. Whoso readeth, let him understand. Then let them which be in Judea flee into the mountain. See, this is, and this is why I'm covering this tonight because it's a critical event that's going to happen in the end times. When you see this happen, this is Jesus Christ warning his disciples and saying, look, when this happens, when you see this abomination of desolation set up in the temple, you're in Judea, you need to get into the mountains. You need to get out of town. Let him which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. saying, when this happens, it's no more, you have no more time to pack your bags and get your stuff ready. He's saying, you just get out and leave by the skin of your teeth right now. You have to go. Verse 18, neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. He said, don't even get your clothing. 
just go. Verse 19, and woe unto them that are with child and to them that give suck in those days, but pray ye that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day, for then shall be great tribulation. For then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. Just like Daniel 12, 1 said, a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even at that same time, and at that time that people shall be delivered. So, and then he says in verse 22 of Matthew 24, and except those days should be shortened, there should no flesh be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And of course, elect is referring to believers. That is going to be another sermon just on who the elect are and, and, and all that. I'll prove that to you. Um, in another sermon. But we see here the great tribulation is prompted by the abomination of desolation being set up. That is the key. That is what is being told to look for. When that happens, get out of town because there is going to be tribulation like you have never even heard of before. The warning then continues in Matthew 24. So the, the events that are going to be happening around the same time. In verse 23, the Bible says, Then... If any man shall say unto you, and this is during this time of great tribulation, then if any man shall say unto you, Lo, here is Christ, or there, believe it not. For there shall arise false Christs and false prophets, and shall show great signs and wonders, insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. So these false Christs are going to arise. They're going to be extremely convincing. They're, it's going to be so convincing, you're going to say, if it were possible for the elect to just be deceived by one of these false Christs, you would be deceived. Thank God it's not possible because we have the Holy Spirit residing in us. He says, Behold, I have told you before, verse 26, Wherefore, if they shall say unto you, Behold, he is in the desert, go not forth. And don't believe it. Someone said to you, Oh yeah, Jesus is here. He's right over here. He's in the desert. Don't believe it. Behold, he is in the secret chambers. Believe it not. Like the Jehovah's Witnesses like to say, Oh yeah, he came and showed himself unto us secretly. Uh, yeah, sorry, false prophets. I'm not going to believe you. Verse 27, For as the lightning cometh out of the east and shineth even unto the west, so shall also the coming of the Son of Man be. See, it's, a, it's a big event. No one's going to miss that. Every eye is going to see him. Now, this warning is given because the Antichrist is going to claim to be the second coming. The Antichrist is the one who sets up the abomination of desolation. The Antichrist is the one that goes to war against the saints. And the Antichrist is going to be the one that's saying, I'm the second coming. I'm Jesus Christ. And he's going to be standing in the temple proclaiming to be God. So when people are saying, yeah, Jesus is here. Didn't you see him? And he's going to be doing miracles. He's going to have lying signs and wonders. And people say, it's got to be Jesus. I mean, did you see all the stuff that he did? He said, don't believe it. This is why we're even told about it. He said, look, this is going to happen. So you know, you know before it happens this is the way everything's going to play out, and the end is not yet. 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2 gives us the same warning. Turn, you, we're done in Matthew 24. Flip, if you would, to 2 Thessalonians 2, and then we're going to go back to Daniel, and we're going to spend a little bit of time doing a little bit of flip back and forth between 2 Thessalonians 2 and Daniel. Second Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.3 says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition. You're saying that day, what day? The day of the Lord, the day, the day of Christ is not going to come until the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The man of sin has not been revealed yet, so we're not expecting Jesus Christ yet because this needs to happen first. Verse number four, and he explains, gives a little bit more detail about who is this, the man of sin, the son of perdition, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. So who's called God? Buddha. Who's called God? Allah. Who's called God today? Jehovah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of deities, if you will, that are called God, that people believe are God. And he's saying that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is going to oppose and exalt himself above all that's called God. I'm greater than all of these gods. I'm the true God. What he's going to say, since all that is worship, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. This needs to happen first. We're going to talk about timing. 
this is going to happen and those believers, those saints who are alive during this time will see these things happen and know that this is exactly what was prophesied in Scripture. If you're watching, if you're paying attention, if you're going to church, if you're reading your Bible, flip, keep your finger here in 2 Thessalonians 2 and flip back to Daniel 11. Flip back to Daniel 11. If you've got a bookmarker, it's good just to keep it in Daniel because we're going to continue to come back to Daniel, but we're going to also be looking in Revelation. So, Daniel 11 in verse 33, we're going to start reading there. And they that understand among the people, because we're going to see another matching description of what we just, just saw here in 2 Thessalonians 2. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, by captivity and by spoil many days. Verse 33 is talking about believers. It's talking about people. It says they that understand. They're going to instruct many. So there's going to be a lot of people just teaching other people, saying, hey, this is, this is what's going on. But they're going to be persecuted, which is why they're going to fall by the sword, by flame, by captivity, by spoil, many days. And it says, now when they shall fall, they shall be hoping with a little help, but many shall cleave to them with flatteries, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them and to purge and to make them white even to the time of the end because it is yet for a time appointed. God's going to allow some of those of understanding, some of those who know what's going on, some of those believers, those saints, he's going to allow them to be tried. He's going to allow them to go through this persecution. He's going to allow them to be martyred. Why? Because they're going to be tried. They're going to be... Um, purged, it says here, and they're going to be made white, even at the time of the end. Verse number 36, it says, And the king shall do according to his will, and he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak marvelous things against the god of gods, and shall prosper till the indignation be accomplished, for that that is determined shall be done. So again, just like we saw in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, 2 Thessalonians 2 talks about the son of perdition who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God. Daniel 11.36 talking about the king who's going to exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak marvelous things. And the reason why I'm pointing these things out is because there, these are events that don't have duplicates. I mean, this isn't just like, oh, this happened once, it's going to happen again, it's going to happen again. These are very specific events. The wording is so similar. I mean, almost identical in many cases. So when you want to understand what's going on, you can compare these scriptures side by side to get the full picture. Because Daniel's going to tell you a little bit more insight than Second Thessalonians is going to do, which is going to give you a little bit different insight than Matthew 24 is going to do, which is going to give you a little bit more insight than Revelation is going to give you. Know, we, we put all of the picture together and we put them side by side and realize, okay, this section of scripture, what is this talking about? This is, you know, and they all line up. And we could get the, the, the full idea of what's going on. So in Daniel chapter 11, it's clear this king that he's referring to is talking about the son of perdition. It's talking about the Antichrist. Verse number 37 says, Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. Basically what this is saying is that he's not going to care about anything or anyone else. He's not going to regard the God of his father. So whatever religion he was brought up in, many people believe, as I do, that, that he, he will probably be um, of Jewish descent, the Antichrist. Now, this is just, I, I can't prove that dogmatically from Scripture is what I believe. It talks about the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God. He's not going to care about any God because he's just going to magnify himself and lift himself up and just say, I'm better than every, everybody and everything. Um, some people think he might be a sodomite because it says he's not going to care about the desire of women. That's a possibility. I don't know. I mean, that, that's not, that's, that is very reasonable to think that, that that's what that's talking about. I don't necessarily think that that's what this is referring to. I think this is just talking about he doesn't care about anyone or anything and there's nothing that's going to, you know, bring him down. He's, he thinks he's above everyone and in, in, in everything that there is. But um, I actually would lean that he probably, I mean, we know he's going to be, he's a reprobate. So it's not that far of a stretch to say that he's, he's, a, he's a homosexual too. Verse number 38. 
But in his estate shall he honor the God of forces, and a God whom his father, whose fathers knew not, shall he honor with gold and silver and with precious stones and pleasant things. So he's basically creating this new God, which he is this God, right? And he's calling it the God of forces, and that's what he is and, and going to um, honor with, with gold and silver and precious stones. Verse 39, thus shall he do in the most strongholds with a strange God, whom he shall acknowledge and increase with glory. And he shall cause them to rule over many and shall divide the land for gain. And at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships. And he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. He shall enter also into the glorious land and many countries shall be overthrown but these shall escape out of his hand, even Edom and Moab and the chief of the children of Ammon. He shall stretch forth his hand also upon the countries and the land of Egypt shall not escape. But he shall have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over all the precious things of Egypt and the Libyans and the Ethiopians shall be at his steps. But tidings out of the east and out of the north shall trouble him. Therefore, he shall go forth with great fury to destroy and utterly to make away many. And he shall plant the tabernacles of his palace between the seas and the glorious holy mountain, yet he shall come to his end and none shall help him. So this is then talking about the war between the, the king of the north, which is this king, which is the Antichrist, and the king of the south. There's going to be a lot of wars going on even you know, through this, this tribulation period where he doesn't actually have this world peace and the whole new world order created yet until right near the very end or until right near before the rapture. Like that's like it's, it's, it's finally going to be solidified there. And when we're looking at timeline of events here, um, I'm not confident that, that these events that we just read here in Daniel 11 comes before or after the abomination of desolation being set up because it talks about... Um, in verse 40, before we start reading about all that, it says, at the time of the end. So it's giving you a time reference, but at the time of the end, meaning what, right. what exact time frame is that? And it makes sense. When, when the Bible is going through certain subjects, it'll flesh out what it's talking about and kind of go chronologically. But then when it's referring to something maybe slightly different, but still all in the same story, it might jump back a little bit and then continue forward again because it's what makes sense. I mean, if you're describing one thing or one person or one event, you'll give all the details and then say, oh yeah, and by the way, this is going on and this is happening too during that time. So I don't necessarily think that all of this happens after the abomination of desolation. I think these are things leading up to that abomination of desolation being set up, that there's going to be this war with the king of the north and the king of the south. You're still in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at verse number 8. And remember, keep your place in Daniel. We'll see a little bit more information is provided about the Antichrist in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse number 8 says, And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Now, this is an also, as a side note, an aspect of God that people don't understand. You say, but I thought the Lord's not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. That's true. But what happens is there comes a point to where, and again, this is more evidence of this, where God is done with them. Otherwise, why would God send strong delusion? What's a delusion? He's tricking people. He's fooling them into believing something that's, that's not true, something that's fake. He's, he's, he's deluding them into following the Antichrist. He's allowing and, and sending them this delusion and these powers and signs and lying wonders are being done so that those who have pleasure in unrighteousness and didn't want to hear the love of the truth, didn't want to have anything to do with God, they will then just go after him. And this is of God that these things are happening. We're seeing this very clear. In 2 Thessalonians chapter number 2, you have no way of explaining that. Otherwise, to reconcile 
um, the fact that God does, God does want everyone to be saved, but when they get to the point to where you reject God, you take the mark of the beast, they want nothing to do with the Lord, then, then he has no problems sending delusions and allowing you to believe a lie. Second, uh, turn, back, turn to Revelation chapter 13. So we saw there in 2 Thessalonians 2, the references to the power that Satan's going to have, the signs, the lying wonders. We saw that in Daniel 11. We saw, uh, and we're going to see that here in Revelation 13 also. Now, Revelation's interesting because Revelation, as I mentioned before, is the, where, where our basis, our foundation is in understanding end times prophecy. But the abomination of desolation, like that phrase, that terminology is not found at all in Revelation. But it's such a significant event, it's got to be there. And it is, and we're going to see it in Revelation 13, this event happening. Um, it's just not referred to in those terms, which is another reason why we started off before even coming to Revelation 13, reading accounts in Daniel, reading Matthew 24, because then we're going to put all this together and see, oh yeah, this is exactly lines up with everything else that we just looked at to this point. Revelation 13, look at verse number one. First, we're going to start off seeing some of the strong delusion that the Antichrist is going to have. And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. Remember, we talked about this with um, the, the great whore in Babylon, was it last week or two weeks ago? And the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. Now, I'm just going to pause right here because I mentioned this before church service, but I want to I wanna make sure everyone hears this. We're talking about how there's so many people that these days that are putting out their prophecy stuff, right? You have these, these groups, these newsletters and everything else that's sent out saying, you know, they, they look at, they, they want to jump on every single event that's happening in the world today. Yeah. Things that are happening in Iran, things that are happening in Iraq, things that are happening, just any, any, any turmoil that's going on. They want to jump on that and say, see, look, this is Bible prophecy being played out right before our eyes right here. This is the leopard. This is, the, you know, and, and they, they try to use the most obscure or the, or the most um, symbolic references that we're going to see in the Bible at all because you need to use things like this to just apply it to whatever you want. That's why, you know, the, the majority of false doctrines in the Bible, when people try to support it, they're going to use parables and say, see, the parable of the ten virgins is just talking about people, how they could lose their salvation. You know, because they could get away with it because they, they could just say it means whatever they want it to say. We don't need, you know, look, this is good information here. When it talks about this, it talks about um, the beast that he saw and, 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 and what, you know, all these references, these symbolic references have meaning to him. And we should study it and try to figure it out. But I'll tell you what, you can figure out all the timeline and all these other things, these events happening without having any clue what the leopard and the lion and the bear mean. You don't need to have that, that information to understand the timeline of events. We have more than enough information to know that something that's happening right now is not talking about this beast being referred to in Revelation 13 with, with whoever is going to send a nuke or with North Korea or whatever. But you've got the people that want to keep selling their newsletters and getting you to subscribe and, and trying to, to, to get the people who are ignorant of scriptures just hooked into their, and really what it is, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's a type of fear mongering. It's this type of like, and, and maybe it's not trying to cast fear in the people, but it's this hook of, oh, we have all this extra Bible information and you're, you're, you believe the Bible. So just look at this. I'm going to give you this information, this insider information about what the Bible is saying is going to happen. And they string you along and string you along and string you along and people buy into it. If you would just take the time to study for yourself and not listen to these fools and not listen to these people are just trying, just, just out to make a buck is all it really is. Mm -hmm. You could get a much better understanding of what's going to happen. So that's why we're doing this tonight too. Just I don't want people getting wrapped up in all the nonsense that's out there from people who want to claim they know Bible prophecy. It's real straightforward. It just, it takes a little bit of work. I mean, we're, we're doing a lot of work tonight. We're going to a lot of different places and trying to put them side by side. And, um, but 
it's worth it. I mean, we're, we don't want to be duped by, by these people who are just not sincere in what they're teaching here. So let's see, verse number two, it talks about the beast. Like unto a leopard, his feet were as the feet of a bear, his mouth as the mouth of a lion, and the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. So the world sees this. They see this deadly wound on a head being healed. Now, again, there's a lot of symbolism when it comes to the beast. And you can think, what's the beast referring to here? Is it referring to a kingdom with a group of kings? Is it you know, and it's used in, in a couple of different ways when we look at the Bible of, of what the, the meaning of the Bible is trying to get across. But when I talk about one of his heads, wounded as a word of death, I believe it's talking about a person, the beast, who's going to have this deadly wound that's healed. He's a ruler. He's going to be a king. And he's going to have a, a, a deadly wound, and then he's going to recover. He's going to come back to life. And I think, what I think this is, is the devil's mock of uh, resurrection, because he's trying to be like the Most High. I mean, that's what the Satan has always wanted. He always has wanted to be like the most. He doesn't want to be his own separate God. So you have Satanists today that are trying to make up, you know, and, and, and they have the pentagrams and their blood, you know, and all these other things and just a totally different type of worship of Satan that's completely different and removed from Christianity. That's not, I mean, while Satan likes the, the attention and wants people worshiping him, that's not really what he wants. He wants to be the most high. He wants to be like the most high, which is why he copies everything that God does. He just wants to be God. And he'd do all these various things in order to receive that attention. And he plays out this, this deadly wound being healed. All the world wondered after the beast, verse four. And they worshiped the dragon, which gave power unto the beast. And they worshiped the beast saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? And there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. So in this context, and this is why I'm talking about the beast is not just some kingdom, it's talking about a person, because the context hasn't changed about the beast. And the people are saying, wow, who is like unto the beast? Who's able to make war with him, with a person? I mean, someone who is killed and now brought back to life, who's going to stand up to that? And then it says there's power given to him to a mouth speaking. I mean, this is a person speaking great things, blasphemies, and it says, and power was given unto him to continue 40 and two months. 40 and two months, guess how long that is? Three and a half years. There's a number coming up again. Verse number six, and he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Now this is exactly what we've already been reading about in Daniel 11, 2 Thessalonians 2. Opening his mouth in blasphemy against God, standing in the temple of God, proclaiming to be God. But the new information here, one of the new things is his deadly wound was healed. And, um, and then we see he's starting to make war with the saints and overcome them. Verse number eight says, And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, starting in verse number 11, we're going to see here the image that's created and is caused to be worshipped by the beast. Verse number 11 says, And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon, and he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast." So again, the lying signs and wonders and fire coming down from heaven. Say, These are biblical things happening. That's what people are going to be saying. And the reasons to believe the Antichrist and the false prophet pointing everyone to the Antichrist. And it says, um, 
So he's, verse 14, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by means of mi those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast, saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. This image, and I'm going to prove this in a second, this is the abomination of desolation that's set up. It's an image. Look at verse number 15. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. The abomination of desolation, worship me or die. The abomination of creating an idol, an image, and setting it in the holy place, which is supposed to be the temple of God, and setting up an image of a false god, an idol, in that very temple, claiming to be God. And if you don't worship me, you're going to be put to death. You don't worship that image. You don't fall down and, and worship the image of the beast. That's the abomination. The abomination of, of an idol being set up in the Lord, bringing desolation on the earth. And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, bond and free, to receive a mark in the right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, saving he that had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here's wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 603 score and 6, or 666, the mark of the beast. Flip back, if you would, to Daniel chapter 11. I'm going to reread for you. We already covered the scripture already in Matthew 24, but in Matthew 24, you might have the impression that the abomination of desolation is a person standing in the temple because it uses the phrase it says here in matthew 24 15 when ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by daniel the prophet stand in the holy place whoso readeth let him understand you say oh the abomination of desolation is standing in the holy place you think of a person standing right, right? i mean it, I, I get that. That, that i could see where you'd understand that but look at daniel 11 and we're gonna look at daniel chapter 12 daniel 11 31 says and arms shall stand on his part and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength and shall take away the daily sacrifice and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. So now they're placing the abomination in the temple. Look at Daniel chapter 12, verse 11. Daniel 12, verse 11. And from the time that the daily sacrifice shall be taken away and the abomination that maketh desolate set up, there shall be 1,290 days. So the standing there can be, I mean, when you set something up, you just, just say, this is, this is standing there, right? I mean, it's, it's, it's sitting there, it's standing there. It doesn't have to be a human attribute. It's something that in our minds, we might just automatically connect with a person, but it's an object. It's the image. And it makes sense because where else are you going to show me the abomination of desolation being set up in Revelation which gives us so much information about the end times of any, do you think it's just skipped over that the abomination of desolation is not even talked about in Revelation? I don't think so. And it goes hand in hand with Re in Revelation 13 with him making, with the Antichrist making war with the saints. Because the abomination of desolation we saw in Matthew 24 is the, the kickoff point for the extreme tribulation against the saints. And the, the key to understanding this, I think, is that some people might think the abomination of desolation is the Antichrist, but it's not. The Antichrist is not the abomination of desolation. The abomination of desolation is set up as the image that people need to worship. Let's go back to Daniel. You're in Daniel now. Let's go back to chapter number 8. You can keep a finger in Revelation because we're going to be going to Revelation chapter 12 also. We're going to look at Daniel 8 and Revelation chapter 12. Man, oh man. Yeah, we're, just, we're, not, going to get, we're not going to get to everything I got here. There's so much. That, the main point is understanding what the abomination of desolation is. Understanding that's an image. Understanding that this is something that's set up. It's an idol put in the temple of the Lord. And... Um, this also helps to explain why God has so much wrath, at least one of the reasons, at the day of the Lord. 
when there's this false, you know, this, this image to Satan, basically, set up in the temple of God, proclaiming to be God. And everyone rallying around and, and saying, yeah, you know, you're God, and taking the mark and worshiping the beast. God finally just, just comes and sets things straight. Daniel chapter 8. Um, we're going to look now at the timing, and I've mentioned this in other sermons, how the timing of this event and the abomination of desolation being set up coincides with Satan being cast out of heaven. So Satan is not the Antichrist either. Satan is the dragon. The dragon is the one that gives the Antichrist his power, right? He's deriving his power from Satan. Satan's giving him this power, but he's a separate entity, a separate beast than the devil, than Satan, right? So while the Antichrist is coming to power and doing his thing, Satan is still doing his own thing and, and helping out the Antichrist or whatever, right? Giving him power until the point where Satan gets kicked out of heaven. And that's when the persecution starts. That's when the abomination of desolation is set up and the image is able to speak, right? I mean, the power is given to the image is, is able to, like, they set up this idol and it's able to talk. And it's, and it's, and it's just given this, this, this supernatural attributes of being able to speak and stuff. And I believe that's because the devil comes out. And the other thing I believe, and I can't prove this dogmatically, but I'll just let you chew on it and figure out what you believe, is that when it says that the, the deadly wound that that, that that king received and then was healed, that the beast received and was healed, I believe at that point is when the devil then will come and possess the Antichrist and then continue on. And that's like the, the, the resurrection. But I don't want to get too, too deep into that because that's just my own opinion on the matter. So you could kind of figure that out for yourself. Daniel chapter 8, though, let's look at this. The timing coinciding with Satan being cast out of heaven. Look at verse number 9 of Daniel chapter 8. And out of one of them came forth a little horn, which waxed exceeding great toward the south and toward the east and toward the pleasant land. And it waxed great even to the host of heaven. And it cast down some of the host of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. Yea, he magnified himself even to the prince of the host, and by him the daily sacrifice was taken away and the place of his sanctuary was cast down. Again, the reference to the daily sacrifice being taken away, and now it's talking about the host of heaven and the stars being cast to the ground. There's other places in Scripture you can look at where angels are being referred to as the host of heaven or the stars. And we're going to see that matching up here in Revelation chapter 12 in just a second. The same, very, very similar phraseology being used here. Verse number 12 here in Daniel chapter 8 says, And an host was given him against the daily sacrifice by reason of transgression, and it cast down the truth to the ground, and it practiced and prospered. Then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto the certain saint which spake, how long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be trodden underfoot? And he said unto me, unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. 2,300 days is six years, four months, and 20 days. Given the 30 day, and, and all, all the, the time that I'm giving you here as far as years and everything is based on a 30 day month. 30 day month, 12 months, Okay, that's the, 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 the way that the calendar, the biblical calendar is being used. And there's a leap month in there. You could, I'm not going to get into all that right now. But um, this time, this six years and four months starts, I believe, when the, when the daily sacrifice is set, when it, when it begins. So about a little less than a year into the beginning of Daniel's 70th week, you're going to have the sacrifice is instituted. So that's another thing to be looking for is that early on, even before the great tribulation happens, when tribulation starts and there's wars and, and these things going on, when that daily sacrifice starts, right. we, I mean, we're getting close. We're starting to get real close. Now, I want to make one more point here because we're talking about a lot of numbers 
And one of the objections that people have about this teaching and about what we believe about when the rapture is going to take place and when these things are happening is the scripture that says, you know, no man knoweth the day or the hour when the Son of Man is going to return. And they'll say, yeah, but see, when all these events start to happen, you will know the day. You can calculate it because he's, the Bible gives us enough information here. Well, when Jesus said that no man knows the day or the hour, he also said, neither does the Son of Man, but the Father only. Okay, at that time when he said that, 100% true. Absolutely. But at some point, you can't just say that that's always eternally true, that no man knows the day or the hour. What happens after it happened? Are we going to know the day or the hour that it happened? Of course we will. I mean, it's stupid to say we wouldn't, right? Do you think Jesus knows the day and the hour that he's going to come back now? Now that he's no longer in human form? Now that he no longer has the limitations set upon him of being in a physical body? Of course he does. He's God. He's got all knowledge. Why would he be restricted anymore? When he said that, he didn't know. And he was teaching, giving the wisdom that he had, and not knowing when that day was going to happen. But now he knows. It doesn't make that verse false. He didn't know when he stated it. Now he does. When all of these things start to come, I mean, this is why he told us these things. So that no man can deceive you. So that when these things start to happen, you know that the end is nigh. That's what the Bible says. I'm telling you all of this information so that you can know. So there is going to be at some point, now are we ever going to know the hour? No. But the day can be calculated if you know the starting point that God determines is this is when this started, you know, and, and, and it happens when the, when the abomination of desolation is set up, when the, the, the sacrifices start to be offered, you could start the countdown and figure, okay, well, as soon as that, that, that sacrifices are started, we know there's 2,300 days. Now, 2,300 days is, is until basically like the end of the wrath, when God's done cle cleansing everything. So um, I, I just wanted to bring that up here. I, did I have you go to Revelation 12? If you didn't, go to Revelation 12. I'm going to reread for you Daniel 8 because I kind of got off a little bit uh, from the point there. Daniel 8.10, uh, this is where I was talking about the timing of Satan being cast out of heaven. Daniel 8.10 said, And it waxed great, even to those of heaven, and it cast down some of the host and of the stars to the ground and stamped upon them. And it talks about him magnifying himself. Revelation chapter 12, verse number 3, reads, And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. Again, the same terminology being used about the stars, a third part of the stars of heaven being cast down to the earth. And um, it says in verse 5, And she brought forth a man-child. It was referring to uh, Jesus Christ being born, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness, where she hath a place prepared of God, that they should feed her there a thousand two hundred and three score days, which again is three and a half years. And there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon, and the dragon fought and his angels and prevailed not, neither was their place found any more in heaven. So they're cast out. Verse 9, And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. The angels. And I don't have time to, to prove to you that sometimes when the Bible is talking about stars and those of heaven that's referring to angels. But try to look that up in your own time and you'll see that, um, that that does happen. So that's when they're cast out. And then in verse 12 of Revelation 12, the Bible reads, Therefore rejoice ye heavens and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea. For the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he hath but a short time. And when the dragon saw that he was cast unto the earth, he persecuted the woman which brought forth the man-child. And to the woman were given two wings of a great eagle, that she might fly into the wilderness, into her place where she is nourished for a time and times and a half of time from the face of the serpent. Again, 
That three and a half year time frame being referenced once more. Verse 15, And the serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. And the earth helped the woman and the earth opened her mouth and swallowed up the flood which the dragon cast out of his mouth. And the dragon was wroth with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is that holy people that, it, that is referred to in Daniel that is being fought against by that, that wicked king, by the Antichrist. It happens when the devil is cast out of heaven, the abomination of desolation is then set up and war is made against the saints. Um, one last thing I want to point up and then, and then we'll close. Um, go back to Daniel chapter 9. I have this whole summary of Daniel 11 and, and some information on what to expect and it gives you a lot more um, things to look for when it comes to who the Antichrist is and what's going to be happening in the world during this time. And I think that, you know, if you're interested in, if you are interested in looking at events that are happening, Daniel 11 provides some good information about the wars that are going to be happening and to give you a little bit of insight of when things are going to be ramping up. Now, we don't know who the king of the north, or, you know, the north and the south kingdoms are. I have no idea who they're going to be. At this point in the world, I have, no, I have no idea who's going to be a king of the north and king of the south. I don't think we can know that yet until the wars actually start happening and we'll see things going, oh, okay, this is, this is starting to look like uh, what's going on here. But in, um, one of the things I just wanted to point out here, because I thought this was pretty neat, is from Revelation 12, it says, The serpent cast out of his mouth water as a flood after the woman, that he might cause her to be carried away of the flood. So there's this flood referenced of, of coming after the woman who's symbolic of you know, the saints or the believers of whom the, um, you know, Jesus Christ came. And then in Daniel 9, look at verse 24, it says, Seventy weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah, the prince shall be seven weeks and threescore and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after threescore and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood. So it says here, the people of the prince that shall come. Not talking about Messiah, not talking about Jesus Christ, the, but the prince that shall come, the ruler that shall come, the Antichrist, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood unto the end of the war. Desolations are determined. So I think that's, that flood is the same flood referenced in Revelation chapter 12. And then in verse 27, it says, And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause a sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for the overspreading of abominations, he shall make it desolate even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. Turn, if you would, to Daniel 11. I, I want to I go over this real quick. We're, I mean, we're almost done. This is the last thing I'm going to do. I'm not going to spend too much time on this, but this isn't going to be its own sermon, so I'd rather just kind of throw it in at the end here. Read Daniel 11. Read all of these chapters on your own and, and, and you know, study Matthew 24, 2 Thessalonians 2, Revelation 12, 13. Um, I think was why I referenced this evening. Daniel 11 some info on what to expect around the time of the Antichrist. So it talks about the king of the north and the king of the south. And talks about them being at war with each other. King of the south prevails against the king of the north. King of the north dies. His son, one of his sons, is, is his successor. And then he begins to fight against the king of the south. So the king of, king of the north, king of the south. King of the south beats the king of the north, if you will. King of the north ends up dying. One of his sons then comes into power and starts fighting again with the king of the south. The king of the south prevails at first, but then the king of the north comes again with more troops. So there's a battle, the king of the north attacks and doesn't uh, prevail. The king of the south 
defends himself, and then the king of the north comes again with more troops, and it says, many shall stand against the king of the south at that time. So there's going to be a lot of people then coming against the king of the south. King of the north starts taking fenced cities and prevailing over the south. The king of the north starts taking islands, but then is persuaded to stop. He goes to return back home. And the Bible says he stumbles and falls and is not found. So basically, he just kind of dies in a mysterious way. He just stumbles, falls, and, and he's gone. That was the, that king of the north. His replacement, the king of the north, is a raiser of taxes, but he's going to be destroyed in a few days. So, and these are, the reason I'm bringing this up is, is this is what's going to happen prior to the Antichrist. There's going to be this, this war going on between whoever the king of the north and king of the south is. King of the north then is going to die somehow. He's going to not be found and stumble and fall. And then his replacement is going to start raising taxes in the kingdom. And the kingdom's a prosperous kingdom, this king of the north. But he's going to be destroyed, it says, in a few days. And it says not with anger or hatred or anything, but he's going to be gone. Not going to be his replacement for very long at all. So just a few days. And then his replacement, the Bible says, is a vile person. And this is the Antichrist that, that, that ends up replacing him. It says he comes in peaceably and gets the kingdom by flatteries. So he's not who the people were looking for at first, but he, he ends up taking, over, taking control of the kingdom by flatteries, by telling everyone how great they are. And then in verse 22, and that's all summary up here to verse 22, it says, And with the arms of a flood shall they, overflow, shall they be overflown from before him, and shall be broken, yea, also the prince of the covenant. And after the league made with him, he shall work deceitfully. For he shall come up and shall become strong with a small people. He shall enter peaceably even upon the fattest places of the province and he shall do that which his fathers have not done nor his father's fathers. He shall scatter among them the prey and spoil and riches. Yea, and he shall forecast his devices against the strongholds even for a time. So he's going to come in with flatteries. People are going to love him because now what he's going to do is his fathers haven't done this. You know, he comes in his great position. He's going to start spreading the wealth around a little bit. He's going to start making the people real happy because he, he, he got his position by flatteries. He's going to get his position in kingdom. And then he's going to say, oh, yeah, see, look, I'm making everything great for you. And it says he's going to scatter among them the prey, the spoil, the riches. He's saying, see, look, I love you guys. I'm here for you. The people are going to eat it up. They're going to love them. He says he shall forecast his device against the strongholds even for a time. Verse 25, and he shall... Stir up his power and his courage against the king of the south with a great army. So again, this is, I refer, I, I believe this is the Antichrist. We'll see that in just a minute. He's still at war. So he's going to be fighting and at war with the king of the south. And it says, And the king of the south shall be stirred up to battle with a very great and mighty army. But he shall not stand, for they shall forecast devices against him. Yea, they that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him. So the king of the south is going to be betrayed by someone who's who's eating with him, basically. They that feed of the portion of his meat shall destroy him, and his army shall overflow, and many shall fall down slain. And both these kings' hearts shall be to do mischief, and they shall speak lies at one table, but it shall not prosper, for yet the end shall be at the time appointed. Then shall he return into his land with great riches, and his heart shall be against the holy covenant. So notice it's after his war and deceitfulness with the king of the south, now his heart's going to be against the holy covenant and he shall do exploits and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come toward the south, but it shall not be as the former time or as the latter. For the ships of Shittim shall come against him. Therefore, he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant." So you start dealing with people who forsake the Holy Covenant. Now, again, I'm not even going to get into it. We don't have time for it. What is the Holy Covenant? What is it referring to? Is this referring to his covenant that he made with the other rulers for a week? Or is this referring to something else? You figure that out. Verse number 31. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that make it desolate, and such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt by flatteries, but the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And this is why I don't think that Holy Covenant is necessarily talking about a covenant with believers. I think it's talking about Holy Covenant that believers have um, somehow because it's, it's in verse 32. It's contrasting 
such as do wickedly against the covenant shall be corrupt by flatteries with the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. So um, he takes the kingdom by flatteries. He corrupts the people that are against the holy covenant with those flatteries and the war continues against the saints. So um, I just wanted to give that out there as, you know, the Antichrist kind of interesting information. I know it's kind of dry. It's a lot of stuff to go through. Um, hopefully it's going to be helpful. You retain some of this information and that we can be vigilant and looking out for these things just in general and being able to warn other people that um, when they start to see things come to pass. And you never know, even after the rapture, not everyone, you know, as long as someone doesn't take the mark of the beast, there's still going to be people that could be getting saved after the rapture. During this time of great wrath, I mean, they may die, you know, a lot of people are going to be dying, but If we could have a testimony at the very least, if people are alive during this time and being able to explain all this stuff now and be able to show people, you know, I mean, one, it's going to be helpful for us to see, hey, these are the signs of the times. This is what's happening. We know this is happening soon. We know when to, to head for the hills. We know when we should be doing the most exploits for the Lord and just and saying, hey, we don't have time for anything else. I mean, right now we're kind of sitting back on our heels a little bit. We're trying to do as much as we can. We're trying to do soul winning and stuff. But when this happens, it's going to be like, I don't have time for anything. I mean, I don't care about my job. I don't care about anything else. We're going to be doing just, just full-blown what does God have me to do right now, all the time, every day. So hopefully, uh, hopefully it didn't just bore you to death, but I like this subject. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for giving us a revelation, dear Lord, for helping us to be able to understand a lot of the, the dark prophecies in the book of Daniel. God, there's so much there. I pray that you would please just open up all of our minds, dear God, help us to understand the, the true and the right things that you have prophesied in the Bible, dear Lord, especially in the book of Daniel. I pray that you please help us all to, to be stirred up to study your words and to understand them, dear Lord. And I pray that you would please just help me to, to can you understand and be able to teach in a way that, uh, that, that makes sense to, to everybody here, dear Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.